to City Conversations. I'm Michael Alexander, the director of SFU City Conversations. We're presented by SFU Public Square. We want to thank our sponsors, SFU Vancouver, and particularly Lori Anderson, the executive director of SFU Vancouver, uh, the SFU City Program, and today's special event on their turf uh, the Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association. They've been wonderful in providing us with this space and the support for it. I also want to make a special shout out to Andrew Petter uh, at the SFU, uh, the president of Simon Fraser University and uh, the SFU president's office, which for once provided us with lunch. You didn't even have to bring your own lunch as we encourage you to do. Thank you for that. I want to acknowledge that this event is taking place on unceded traditional Coast Salish territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And, well, normally I would say despite the look of this formal uh, lecture room, but this is not a very formal lecture room. The point is we don't have speakers and an audience at, at City Conversations. We have presenters and we have participants, and you are the participants. Who's new, to, to, who's new here? Who has not been to a, a city conversation before? Welcome, thank you for joining us. Here's how it works. Our presenters are going to briefly frame the conversation. They'll take just 10 minutes apiece. Most of the time is for your questions, but not just your questions. We want to hear your opinions. We want to know about your observations. The point is we want to encourage conversation. It's not just lecture and, and, and audience response. Uh, obviously today it's not rude to eat your lunch, uh, particularly today. If you're tweeting, the uh, hashtag is at CityConv, C-I-T-Y-C-O-N-V. And if you are uh, new and are not on our email list, please sign up at the table over, over here uh, after the event. Uh, there may be a uh, sign-up sheet being passed around. We'll send you information on every city conversation once a month. Today's conversation is on Vancouverism. Our city's label and the core city lifestyle it created. It's now internationally known, imitated, and used as inspiration. How did Vancouverism happen? What are its principles and elements? What are its successes? What did it miss? What lessons might it have for our, for our upcoming citywide plan? We're really delighted to have the former co-director of city planning, Larry Beasley. He's now written the guidebook, and today is its launch. It's over there at the, uh, uh, at the tent. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, I'm almost finished with it. Uh, I would have finished it last night, but I had the choice of making a few laps on my bike of, uh, of uh, Stanley Park, of the Stanley Park Hill. Sorry, Larry. Um, and our other presenter is Ann McAfee, the former co-director of city planning with Larry during this time of truly dramatic city change. We know that many of you have your own observations and opinions, so we're going to add about 15 minutes to our event time. Instead of stopping at 12.30, we'll go on till 12.45. If you have to get back to work, uh, uh, we understand, but we really uh, want to give a bit more time for this. We know the interest is so high. And Larry will be signing and uh, selling books afterwards. So it's now it's your turn, particip uh, uh, presenters. Larry, I think you're going first. I am. You ready? So I'm going to have to use notes, and it's because I've become old. I just can't remember all this stuff. First... Yeah, she actually is. I have to say it. Anyway, uh, 
First, I do want to thank Simon Fraser University and Andrew Petter in particular for helping us to get the message out about uh, this book and uh, about our story, really. And uh, Andrew was so, so kind, even before the book was out, he said, uh, I'd like to host uh, an event to, to help uh, people hear about the book, and I was just thrilled. And so I really want to thank him. Um, Ann and I are on the podium today because, uh, well, we've been working together now for so many years, it's unbelievable. Uh, we were co-directors for 15 years or more. We were deputy directors before that. We were working together constantly. We had the only gender-integrated planning service that I've ever known since or before. And we're very proud of that because in those days, our profession wasn't as integrated as it needed to be at the leadership position, and Ann and I made sure that was the case. And uh, we're very proud of that. The other reason that uh, we, it's good for us to be talking about this is because uh, we were on the scene from the beginning, actually before the beginning of Vancouverism, and we stayed right through until it was really fully realized. And we did different jobs. We had a very good division of labor. Uh, there were lots of things that I just couldn't do, and Anne was better at that than anyone I knew, and there was a few things that I could do. And so um, working together was always a thrill, and also working with the team that we worked with. The second reason I'm particularly glad that we're all together in this format is that I wrote this book so that it would start more of a conversation about the future of our city. I wrote this book because I want uh, people to be inspired to talk about the issues with the same kind of, uh, of um, thoughtfulness that we used to have back in those days when we were trying to invent Vancouverism. And so what Ann and I are going to do in part is we're going to reminisce about some of those things that became the elements, the, 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 the key points of Vancouverism. And I think both of us are probably also going to talk about some of the issues that remain in the city today. Uh, Vancouverism was not the kind of thing you finished uh, at all. It was something that is a, continuously dis a continuous discovery and a continuous realization, which is one of the great things about the city. I am really, really happy today that uh, three city councilors are here. Marguerite Ford is here. Lynn Kennedy is here, and Gordon Price is here. I think if, you would, if they would raise their hands, I would like people to see these great, great leaders who led us through these uh, very inventive times and were a part of it. Uh, Lynn was reminding me that we were at Harvard together talking about Vancouverism. Uh, those were many years ago, and they were important things for us to, to learn about as we moved forward. So I'm so happy to hear there. Are there any other elected officials here that I haven't recognized? If so, you know, we bureaucrats always do that. We always recognize the elected officials. It's just there's somebody we do, isn't it? So the story covers really the time from Expo 86 to the 2010 Olympic Games. It's a rough time frame. Of course, it was in gestation before that with the great leadership of Ray Spaxman. And it continues today with the extraordinary agenda for uh, green urbanism that this city has undertaken. But the period that we're going to emphasize and talk about first and foremost is that time between Expo and the Olympics. And in that time, there are four things that stand out in my memory as being so important and that are emphasized in my book. The first was that um, it was a time when we had gone through the uh, saving of old neighborhoods. Old neighborhoods when Ann and I first started were all collapsing all around us, Kitsilano and Mount Pleasant. Well, we had gone through that time. And so Vancouverism really focused a lot on the inner city. Uh, it, it, it was a story of just Vancouver as compared to, say, the greater Vancouver region and the other municipalities, the other 20 municipalities. Uh, it was a time when we were trying to rethink how the core of our city might be redeveloped, but also how the other neighborhoods around it could be integrated to create a better place to live and work and, and make your life. And so that uh, fact that it was an inner city story is a very important thing to know 
because uh, it has a lot of biases related to that. We came to call what we were doing in the downtown peninsula, where I had more uh, involvement and was looking after the other neighborhoods of the city, among many other things, including doing a whole plan for the whole city. But in my part, we called it the Living First strategy because we said, and we were one of the first cities in North America to say this, is we wanted tens of thousands of people to come back and live in the city. We wanted them to be the, the lifeblood uh, of the city, rather than, if you recall, at that time, people were leaving the city. They were going to the suburbs, and we wanted to change that. Um, and so that Living First strategy was what we put our minds to. We said we would accommodate any way that anyone wanted to live in the city, any kind of living environment that we could think of. Uh, and now it's been pretty successful. In fact, it's maybe been too successful. It has over 120,000 people are living in the, in the core city and around that. We also wanted that to be not just singles and, uh, em and, and uh, young singles and empty nesters. We wanted it to be all kinds of people. And now there are more than 10,000 children living downtown. And you have to know that that is extraordinarily unusual still today in North American cities the fact of children, and if you walk around the city, the inner city, you will see children everywhere. I was taking a group of people around this morning, and they're just kids everywhere. And so it is a family, a, a family place. I would say it's become so successful, it has some negative uh, spin-offs that we're now worrying with, and that the next generation has to worry with, like the loss of some people that we want to be included. Uh, and the, the loss of workspace that we want to be included in the city. I'll come back to a couple of those things in a minute. The second thing is it's a story of design. For the first, one of the first times in a North American city in the modern times, this was a, a, an idea to design the city, not to let it happen by accident. It was a, a time when we were okay. We were perfectly happy to talk about beauty and trying to make the place more uh, uh, livable and trying to reflect the beautiful natural setting in which we, uh, w this city sits. Uh, at, when we started, they used to say it was a setting in search of a city, and you don't really hear that anymore. Uh, it was a time really where we were fostering neighborliness, so we were designing buildings very carefully to make sure people could live closer together. It was a time when we were experimenting with density and diversity, and we wanted to make sure that as we densified, we didn't make it worse, because really most people don't like density. They don't like the, live, the living uh, quality of, of density. And so we had to say, no, how do we make density, dense living, diverse living, delicious, preferred, that you would actually want to buy it. And so it was a time of that. Uh, and it was a time of really even pushing things like view corridors and the shape of the overall skyline of the city. Well, we were really interested in design. It was also a time of trying to be more socially responsible. We, we knew in those days there were many, many poor people that were being left out. They, were, they weren't finding housing. They were being pushed out. Even Expo 86 pushed people out of the old hotels. And so we wanted this to be a time when we were more inclusive. And that's why we had a very strong social housing policy. And people who are younger don't realize that in that period, all over our country, people were not no longer building social housing. We were one of the few cities in the country in that time that continued to build social housing. Cameron Gray, one of our colleagues, was fighting every day for that. So it was a time of that, but also of those families, of bringing families back into the equation as you know, an integral part of everything. Children were very important to us. Seniors were very important to us. Um, it was really a time of everything that we could do to be inclusive. Now, we know that we were not really inclusive enough. Now we know that there is a missing sector, and now we have to work on that. But I want you to know that we set some principles in place back then that should be helpful as the, modern, the current uh, generation is dealing with that. And third, it was a time, uh, it was a, this was a story of collaboration. This was a story where the city took a leadership role, but there was an equal role for citizens. We were always talking to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of citizens, special interest groups the development community, business community, nothing could be done by us 
or just by them. We all had to work together. And so we built a whole regulatory framework to motivate that to happen. Uh, we put in place the involvement of all kinds of people, including architectural peers and others, to advise us all the time. So constantly we're bringing people into the equation. Ann and I used to say that we had uh, one of our staff out in the street talking to citizens every day of the year except Christmas and Boxing Day. We had people always out. And it wasn't just when we had a development and we were asking their opinion. We were talking to citizens about the kind of city that they wanted in the future. There are some continuing challenges. They're out there and they're big and some would say they're getting bigger. Some of those came, uh, have come more recently. We didn't even really understand them in our day. Some of them are the result of what we did in our day. And some of them are things we just were never able to solve in our day. And so the agenda of cities, of the city here is still absolutely important to have a very aggressive action. And I hope that this next generation will tackle these in the way that my generation, I believe, we can say confidently did tackle the issues of our day. Uh, there, there are several resets that I talk about in our book. One is reconvening our relationship, the government's relationship with the people. That needs to be refreshed. Another one is that there is the possibility now of maybe reclaiming over half the public space that's now used by cars and other things for people, for events and activities like this. And then there are two others, and they are the big ones. One is that we have not solved. We haven't come close to solving the issues of mental illness and homelessness uh, and, and providing services and support for people with, with uh, addictions, alcohol and drug addictions. We haven't come close to solving the problem of the very poor in our community. And in my book, I call for a reset that was even bigger than the Vancouver Agreement, which was a huge thing that uh, Judy Rogers, our then city manager, uh, advocated and brought all the governments together to try to solve those problems. We didn't solve them. And so that's a big reset we still have to do. And the final one, of course, is affordability. We have a, a, an emerging missing middle. And unfortunately, the defensive approach we're taking right now, which is up the taxes, up the taxes on different things, doesn't seem to be solving the problem. What we're going to have to do is what smart cities are starting to talk about all over the world, successful cities, and that is to create a secure middle-income sector of housing. We've had a secure low-income sector. We're now going to have, have to have a secure middle-income sector. I don't know if you realize, but successful cities all over the world are experiencing the same problem of affordability. We're not unique at all. It's a huge emerging problem around the world for middle-income people. And so now we have to have new ideas. In the book, I talk about five or six new ideas. It won't be done by government. It won't be done by the private sector. It will be done when people get together and collaborate. In the book, I also talk about a number of things which I think are relevant to other cities. I don't try to, in this book, to suggest that these ideas work for other cities. Some of the principles seem to be relevant. But I do say that securing access to housing uh, and other things like that are things that are important to other cities uh, as well. There are some other things I talk about. Public leadership is important in other cities. I work in other cities where the, the city government is a passive agent, not an active agent. In this city, the city government was an active agent. Uh, collaboration, acting from principles, that was something we learned from Ray Spaxman. Organizing for success, reorganizing the city in order to be successful, and building public constituency. There was nothing that we did that we took forward to the city council that Ann and I would not be sure that we had tens of thousands of citizens behind us. I'll close by saying that yes, there are many problems out there. We can't be complacent. But you know, there's nothing wrong with spending a moment to celebrate the success, to celebrate the invention, which is now being tapped in by people all over the world in their cities. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what my book is about. I hope we can celebrate our, our uh, extraordinary invention by hundreds and hundreds of people creating what we now call Vancouverism. 
And then I hope we can be inspired by it to do a hell of a lot better as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. That was a bit more than 10 minutes, but, uh, but thank you. And Anne McAfee, it's all yours. Oh, Larry lectured me yesterday. Keep it to 10 minutes, Anne. <laughs> Thank you for writing your story of Vancouverism. I have a different story of Vancouverism, partly because I grew up in Vancouver in the 50s and 60s. And at that time, we got around by walking, biking, and taking the bus. In fact, looking back, much of what we did I can remember two boyfriends I had, not at the same time, <laughs> who lived in the West End within walking distance of downtown, something we're inspiring people to do today as part of Vancouverism. So for me, some of the principles of Vancouverism are really a back to the future. But I also remember, how many of you lived here when the city would be covered with smog from the industry in False Creek? That clearly changed. In fact, my first job with the city was participating in the 1974 downtown plan. And at that time, we had no idea how fast change would happen in Vancouver. Since retiring, I often have people ask me, how did Vancouver change so fast into such a livable city? And sometimes that's in a big auditorium, but often it's sitting around having a coffee. So I have a portable planner. And my portable planner describes five characteristics which I think made Vancouveris Vancouverism work. The first is our legislation. If you look at most cities in Canada, they're all creatures of the province, and the province keeps a pretty tight rein on them. In fact, if somebody wants to appeal a decision of a city council, it can go back to, in most cases, the province and be appealed. <laughs> now, in Vancouver, it's a little different. Here, the provincial government wrote a city charter, and while there's still obviously a link to the province, decisions that city council made are not immediately appealable to the provincial government. That gave us a real nimbleness in Vancouver. If we saw a problem or a policy wasn't working, we could immediately go in and look at how to fix it. So if one principle was legislation, the next principle in my mind, or underlying principle, was leadership. And as Larry introduced, we have Marguerite, we have Gordon, we have Lynn. One of the interesting things during the 30 years of Vancouverism was that some of the councillors were COPE and some were MPA and TEAM. But as staff, it was very difficult to tell which was which because all the councillors shared similar values no freeway into downtown, people living downtown, <coughs> growth pays its way. So a lot of what made Vancouver happen were councils who were consistent over 30 years. I've worked in other cities where every new mayor wants a new plan. So there's no consistency. The third thing I think was very important to Vancouver was the learning we did. There were no policies, well I can only think of one or two that council said you've got to get out in the next few weeks. Most policies went through a considerable amount of analysis. Well before people were talking about sustainability, 
all of our policies were going through an economic, a social, and environmental analysis. We were looking at policies from the point of view of everyone's life cycle. Did it work for children? Did it work for young adults? Did it work for the elderly? And we were looking at policies from the point of view of, will it work today? And what about the future? Most buildings last 100 or more years, infrastructure, and children today will likely live to see policies happen over a long period of time. So I think one of the things that was critical was that we were doing a lot of analysis and learning before we brought policies to council. Not only were we learning, we were listening. And I can't think of many policies we did that didn't involve input from stakeholders and from the public. The last big job I did at the city was being involved in city plan. Over 100,000 people in the mid-1990s participated in setting directions for the city or advising council on directions for the city. And finally, when you look at all of those initiatives and directions, it's fine to have lots of policies. But unless you actually take those and locate them, nothing happens. And I think chapter nine of your book, Larry, really talks about the importance of taking place and policy and putting them together. Not only in Larry's book, but I think in reality, what has sparked and made Vancouverism work are the number of people, many of you here, who actually walked the talk and lived downtown or turn in their car for walking, biking, and transit. So I think those five features, the legislation, the leadership we had, the learning, the listening, and the locating of the policies made Vancouver what it is today. But as Larry mentioned, there were some things we, we didn't do. Certainly housing affordability hasn't been helped. In fact, it might even be hindered by the livability that's been brought to the city. There's the issues of life and loss of livability, particularly in the downtown east side. There are some things we did that have got lost in the mists of time. And I think one of the things that's got lost in the mists of time is the connection between City Hall and the community. And that's something that will have to be reestablished. There's new issues. Climate change is more of an imperative. Resilience. Looking at the whole issue of reconciliation. These are all topics we didn't address because they hadn't even emerged to that extent to the forefront. So I think one can hope that the new city plan that council adopted the work program on Tuesday will actually take us those next steps and write the next chapter of Vancouverism. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, and thank you for an object lesson that we don't need computers, we don't need whiteboards, what we need is great analysis a long view, and a piece of string. OK. Participants, now it's your turn. Raise your hands. I'll call on you. Again, your questions, but in particular, your observations, your opinions. Yep. Right here. I'll, get, I'll get to you, the others. Okay. Um, hi, uh, hi, my name is Chris Chung. I'm a, I'm a journalist here in Vancouver. I write about urban issues for the TAI. And um, I haven't had the fortune of interviewing either of you yet. Um, but as someone who was born and raised here, I, 
admire what both of you have done very, very much. Um, and what, one of the questions I wanted to kick off on, um, not about glass or affordability, because I guess someone else will probably mention it later, but um, how Vancouverism begets uh, what some people call complete communities. Um, so diversity of transportation options, densities, land use. So not just living, shopping, or working, but also maybe making of things. Um, housing options for, for tenure and, and for price. And hopefully that would lead to uh, a diversity of people in terms of uh, income, in terms of um, families, um, in terms of a mix of cultures and so on. And I, uh, as someone who's grew up, grown up here, I, I really see this texture in uh, a place like South Hill, for example. You have a lot of, there, is, there are condos, but there's also co-ops. Uh, there's a very vibrant high street, and somehow uh, parking, uh, free par parking is able to survive there as well. Um, and even Metrotown, with a lot, of it it, a lot of its faults, I do see that there as well. Um, you know, there is the mall, but mom and pops are still able to hang on. There are some bits of industrial that are still able to hang on, some rental as well. And I think we think of Vancouverism a lot of the times as intensely urban in terms of its form. Uh, but as for, as for some scholars, they've said that um, it, it does still have a very suburban spirit in some ways. It's, it's, it can be domestic, it can be quite tame, uh, homogenous in some ways. Um, it's not too intensely urban in that way. Um, and Van while Vancouverism does try to be democratic, I think that Inter it still requires uh, huge amounts of capital. It still requires uh, that strong bureaucracy that you mentioned earlier. So I guess at the end of the day, my big questions are, is, is Vancouverism too tame? And is, is there more room for uh, more texture? I, I think Vancouverism is too tame. I don't think you can ever define when it isn't. Because no matter what I think we invent, as human beings, we should be trying to make it more interesting, more complex, more diverse. Uh, Anne and I had the pleasure years ago of taking um, Jane Jacobs around uh, Vancouver. Jane Jacobs, if you don't know, is one of the great urbanists of, of the world, now sadly passed away. I'm going to run. <laughs> and after the whole thing, you know, she could be kind of mean if she wanted to, and after the whole thing, we asked her, what, what, what do you think about what you're seeing? And compared to much of her experience, she said, it all comes down to one word and you're doing it, and that word is diversity. And then, being Jane Jacobs, she said, but you're not doing it enough. Keep making it more diverse. Keep adding, adding, adding. And I think that's what has to happen. What I'm enjoying now, and I'm sure Anne is too, is when we now see these principles moving out into Vancouver suburbs, and we're seeing the town centers coming alive, and different versions of those. It doesn't have to be high density. Those principles that we all espoused work just as well at low and medium density. The idea of diverse and complete communities is important. And you as citizens, every time you see a proposal or a plan that is not a complete community, you should get angry about it and you should be against it. I'll tell you there are some plans out there right now that I think are leading us away from complete communities. And I think we have to fix that. Picking up on one piece of that, what's happening in the suburbs. We did very well in Vancouver on large pieces of land, False Creek, Coal Harbor, where you had basically one owner and the whole complete community could be planned. What I see happening in some of the suburban areas is a much more difficult challenge. I happen to live in Coquitlam hate to tell you, Dr. Density doesn't live at the highest density. <laughs> However, within a few blocks of where I live, near the Lougheed Station, there's approvals in place and buildings going up for the population of the West End. And the challenge that much of the region is facing in these new transit-oriented development centers, which is what we're trying to do, the challenge is how do you take parcels of property where you own a parcel, you own another, you own another, and each of you wants to do a 60-story building, and where is the coordination for community coming from? 
I'm not seeing it, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges we're facing in the region now. We're doing the transit-oriented development, but we're not necessarily building community for the number of people we're going to be putting in those neighborhoods. I just want to add to that. The other thing we're not doing is we're not looking at our historic uh, uh, fabric of buildings well enough. You know, we'll identify and save the real high quality er, uh, historic building, uh, but uh, there are thousands of buildings which aren't that high quality necessarily, but they ha are built, they are livable, they are good, and they have a lot of character, and they have a lot of vested energy within them that doesn't need to be wasted. And as we build, it just can't be another tower and another tower. It has to be, let's save what we can, let's reuse what we can, let's do all of that. And I think that leads to that diversity you're talking about. Gentleman here, and then woman in the back, and then this gentleman. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, thank you very much for such a really, really good, 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 everything that we want to know about the city. I am not Vancouver from original, but it's about 10 years that I am living here permanently. I am a civil structural engineer, and one thing that always a bit worries me about Vancouver is the infrastructure of the city. If you look at this city, for example, from here, waste tasting, if you go up to the east, there are about maybe more than 20 cross sections. All of these cross sections or crossroads are the same level. Because of that, and also pedestrian walking, there is nothing but they have to cut off the traffic. And in traffic, in traffic congestion, you know, how much economically and socially and even environmentally, it brings a lot of issue. In two-day technique and two-day engineering walls by TBM, tunnel boring machine, you can make a lot of, infra a lot of um, uh, in fact, tunnels, pedestrian tunnels, that we call it in British English, we call it subway. You know, just so the people can walk through. This is one of the things that has to be done. Other things is that by viaduct, by bridges, by tunneling, more connection between the place to place. Because the lack of that, if you see the tra traffic jam, in three years in a row, Vancouver is not, hasn't got a good, also it is a, one of the best cities of the North America, is still because of that the city is suffering. So what I think, it is not easy, but if it starts, people get to use engineers, details, has got a lot of things to do. However, I believe Vancouver is a rich city, and I think it can be done. For making it as a result, I believe that in uh, infrastructure, urban infrastructure, and also the traffic is something that is ignored. Thank you very much. I, I want to comment on that. I, Anne, you go first this time. Yeah. I went first last yeah. time. To me, Vancouver rejected freeways back in the early 1970s. And I think that made Vancouver I think the answer isn't to look at more ways to move the car. I think the answer has to be looking at more ways to put the kind of mix of uses close enough together that people can move by walking, biking, transit. It's a choice, and I don't think anyone will run for election in Vancouver and get elected on spending the money to try and make the cars move easier. I think what the focus has always been and would likely continue to be is how do you encourage people to live and work and have parks and recreation and shops close enough together that they don't need to travel the long distances and if they are going long distances then the transit system. Yeah. I'll also I'll also say that uh, from an urban design point of view, there's something that we've learned. You know, you think to yourself, okay, if the people can walk under, over, and the cars can go through, it'll all work very well. The trouble is that when it actually happens, it ends up being a very brutal situation by and large. What we find is that when you separate people and you separate cars and you separate everything into their separate alignments, you get less safety, you have more incidents, 
you find that it's such a brutal uh, uh, concrete environment around you. And I say that from the point of view of going, having gone and visited some cities who've tried to do that. Because it sounds like a first blush a good idea. In the end, it backfires. I'm sorry to say. And so that's why we went the, v the other approach that Anne's just described. That's why we said rather than keep building more, more buildings, more, more things to move people, why don't we try to just get people closer together? Why don't we try to have shorter trips, fewer trips? Why don't we try to make a city where you would prefer to walk because it's easier? I walk seven to 10 kilometers a day, not because I'm trying to, but because I move around living here and working here and being here, it's way easier. In fact, you'll cringe when I say this, but there was a point at which we actually said congestion was our friend. Yeah. Because it motivated people to think about the location. In the generation before, several generations before, in the interest of lifestyle, people were moving further and further distances away. We understood why they did that, and so we wanted to change the city so that they wouldn't have to do that anymore. There is one final thing I want to say, and I say this in my book. In the end, congestion isn't our friend. In the end, we also have to use the street system that we have as efficiently as we can, but that doesn't mean you expand it, that doesn't mean you, you make it you know, seamless. It means that it's a balance between cars and transit and walking and biking, and we have the best system. Over there. Hello, hi, Shauna Sylvester and Larry and I'm over here. There we go. First of all, I love your work and I love the principles of Vancouverism and I love what they have done for this city. There's some things I, I'd like to change. But the biggest thing that I would like your feedback on is you talk about how important the communities are. And we saw in 2012 a decision to start through our Mayor's Task Force on Affordable Housing going up on our arterials. And what that has done to our high streets, our small businesses, West 10th, Main Street, Canby, Cam, uh, Denman Street, we're losing them. We're losing because we've property taxed them out. And I want to get your sense of what is the alternative to going high on those high streets and putting the density within that walkability without losing our small businesses. <laughs> Very good question. In fact, I remember as a naive planner many years ago, saying to the then director of planning that we should all be brought to court for putting so many people living on the busiest streets. He wasn't quite sure what I was talking about, I think, but I think it's what you're referring to. The vision that came out of the last city plan in the 90s were two things. One was the idea of neighborhood centers. So you didn't necessarily build all the way along streets. Rather, you created a center and you zoned for a mix of houses the, in the center and around it. And basically, a Knight and Kingsway and maybe to a degree Norquay were the only two places that that happened before the whole program imploded. And that's another story. There are areas of the city, particularly, not on the traffic lines, particularly in the southeast section of the city, where people at the time really wanted to see much more choice of housing throughout the neighborhoods. Most of the rest of the city in the neighborhood, in the lower density neighborhoods, people wanted those sort of centers. And I think we've moved from those centers into continuing to put almost a barrier between the single family homes and the most possible people on the noisiest possible streets. I, I would go further. I believe that was um, denying the issue. I think it was trying to close our eyes to the real issue, which was diversity of housing within communities. It seemed easier. We put it on the edge, then most people in the middle won't worry about it. You know, 
that's the end of the story. But I have always felt, and Anne and I have had many conversations about this, that it, it's not necessarily a good idea just to put everyone in the most noisy uh, area of your city. And it's also not necessarily a good idea to take those secondary and tertiary streets where there are independent retailers and wipe them out with that kind of development. But I'm going to tell you two stories that I think is a better way to go. And one of them is, is Anne's story. Anne went into neighborhoods. She only made it into two or three with her team. And they sat down with citizens over a f decent period of time and they said, now where are you going to live when you want to get out of this house in the neighborhood? And they said, well, we don't have a place. Well, let's find a place. And then th she said, where are your children going to live when they want to get out and have their own home in this neighborhood? And they said, well, there's no place. And she said, well, let's find a place. And she worked with them and they did find spots. They found good spots, some were along major streets, some were in leftover land that was that, some was a very gentle densification, and they found uh, answers. Years before that, I was a neighborhood planner. And we went into neighborhoods that were in really bad shape. And we said to people, let's stay, instead of going to the suburbs, stay and let's let's revitalize your neighborhood and we worked all together and we found all kinds of solutions and including solutions to housing uh, diversity so what I'm trying to say is that you have to go into communities you have to be very respectful of people and you have to work your way through in detail street by street property by property place by place and say how would you like your community to evolve? Where would you like to include those additional things? When we just decided we were going to do eco-density and everyone had to have X number of units, no, the public we didn't turned decide. Somebody someone decided. else decided. <laughs> we didn't decide. <laughs> but when that happened, we stopped talking to our citizens in a serious way. And the net effect is we haven't been talking to them in the way that you've want to talk to them and that we talk about in well over 15 years. So I'm sorry to say yeah. that's yeah. the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I live on my own in Carisdale and I don't own a car. Uh, two things. One for me, in my estimation, the lifeblood of a city is the people and how they interact and relate and exchange. And that needs to be supported. And creating neighborliness is all up to us we need to reach out to our neighbors and create neighborliness. The second thing is I'm surprised neither of you mentioned food security, community gardens, mm -hmm. urban farming, that whole realm. Mm -hmm. Well, the day is young. Yes. <laughs> and I might say some of the developments that I'm seeing going in the suburbs and the planners out there are saying, what could we do as amenities for these high density developments? community gardens seems to be one of the big things that could be done to bring community together and give people a chance to get out of their individual home. Yeah. But I'll also say that we, you know, I do work around the world. I work mm -hmm. in the Nordic countries, the Middle East, Australia, the United States. We are one of the few places on the planet that is secured and saving our agricultural land in this yeah. region. We are the one of the few cities on the planet that is almost twice the density per block because over a third of our land has been saved for agriculture. You know, back when we did that, I don't think they were talking about food security. I think they were just talking about it's good agricultural land. Now we know it's also about food security. Just four years ago, the city of London did its first food security plan. And one of their recommendations after the Thatcher years took apart their green belt was to go back and find the industrial land or the uh, agricultural land they had left and save it. We are doing that. But you have to be vigilant, every one of you, because that land is under pressure every single day for more development. And you also have to be vigilant that people don't just buy it for speculation and stop farming. Yep. Because that's why, that's why you have, we will have food nearby when others don't. A generation ago in Shanghai, 80% of the food that people ate in Shanghai was harvested and, and collected within 50 miles of Shanghai. Today, and I know there's people in this room that know that, it's less than 20%. 
And it's because, unlike Vancouver, they just let the agricultural land go. We can't do that. And so it will be under challenge in the next decade. And I hope everyone will say, that was a good idea back then, and it continues to be a good idea now. That's my view. Yep. One of the things I'm finding when I'm working elsewhere in the world is places like Melbourne and Auckland are trying to create the green zone or the agricultural area around the city that we have, but they've left it too late. Yep. And what's happening now, they're coming in with plans that say, oh, 70% of new housing should be in existing areas and you know 30% can go into the agricultural land. You want to bet everybody who owns a piece in the agricultural land figures they're part of the 30%. And it's slowly getting, it's not even, not only getting, not getting set up, it's getting continually eaten away. So I think we have to look <coughs> back at this case at the provincial government and what they did in creating the ALR. Yeah. I love you're holding my book. <laughs> uh, well, uh, first of all, I should say that I'm glad this book is out. It uh, helps Vancouverize a little bit of further identity. I should uh, recommend it to uh, my friends to read this book. You know, Vancouver was known as a backwater in the Western Pacific before Expo 86. And we have come a long way to get this to this point today, but still struggling, you know, with a couple of things, you know. The most important is the infrastructure. Urban planning here has been really poor. Look at the West End and the uh, Beach Avenue, Denman Street, Robson Street, you know, two lanes going this way or the other way. So uh, one thing that has been neglected is the infrastructure. Uh, the other one is city beautification. We rely on Vancouver's natural beauty for beautification. But look at these benches in this area. They can be more beautiful with little cost. So there are different designs of statues, you know, squares and places to make city more beautiful. So beautification has been really neglected. This area, I believe, is the end of the world. People are pushing north and they are going west. This is the northern and the western point in the world, this territory, and for the years to come, people in thousands and millions are coming to this area and they should be accommodated. And, uh, you know, and uh, you know, one criticism that I have uh, for most of the municipalities around Vancouver is the question of chicken or eggs infrastructure or population. They are interested in property taxes. Look at the North Shore municipalities. They are issuing property permits, you know, ongoing, constantly without any access to the mainland. And they don't think about, you know, doing this as soon as possible. And uh, the other thing is that decision, municipal decisions are taking a long time. We call it public consultation. It takes 12 years to find out whether we need a third crossing from North Shore to the Lower Mainland or not. Thank you. Now here's a good example of how co-directors of planning can work. You see, my expertise was urban land economics and lum number crunching and worrying about how many people we could manage to find housing with limited money. Larry's the design person, so you got this question. <laughs> <laughs> she says that, and then she did some great design things, too. Not the least of which, by the way, you may not know this, but the first really empirical research on housing families with small children in the city at higher density was done by Ann McAfee. She was the person who did that. And that's led to all those thousands of people, children living downtown. So maybe you're a bit of designer. <laughs> but I will say the part of the conversation that when you talked about the public realm and the design of the public realm, I absolutely agree with you. The fact is that we're learning all over the world that really a part of bringing people back to more diversity and density in the kind of complete communities you were talking about is that it's a positive experience. It's not a minimal experience. It's not a utilitarian experience. It has to be a wonderful experience. That means landscape. That means art. That means beautiful paving. It means all those things. 
And it's not a luxury. It's the same way that you would have decently good housing in your home. We want to have decently good finishes in our public environment. We have a particular problem in this city, which I talk about in my book, and it's driving me crazy. And that is we're not maintaining what we have well enough. I don't know if you notice, but if they do a little fix on the sidewalk, we have asphalt for the next 16 years. We have to change that. We have to put more into the maintenance of this public realm. Uh, you know, we, we negotiated some of the greatest public realm improvements that any city would want to have, and now I start to see them being blemished. I will tell you this, there's a couple of cities in the world uh, one of them is nearby Portland, Oregon. Another one is fairly far away, Stockholm uh, in Sweden, where the public realm is where they actually express themselves as a society. And they're doing wonderful things. And then the other thing that's coming in, which I hope we will embrace, is bringing back the natural species, the natural environment. We, we've gotten to the place where really the natural environment is over there, and then we do something different over here. Really smart landscape architects around the world are insinuating natural species. Um, Cornelia Oberlander, one of our greatest living landscape architects, puts natural species, which are very resilient to all the situations here, and use a lot less water, et cetera, et cetera. That's a part of the future, but we really have to design our public realm way better. I totally agree with you. You mean this isn't the city of, of cedar hedges? <laughs> Everywhere you look. Uh, yes, in the, in the back, please, and then over here. I have a very simple question. Um, I am an ordinary citizen. I only get one vote every whatever number of years it is. In the meantime, what can I do towards continuing Vancouverism and making this a very livable city. I live downtown and I would hate for it to change back to what it was. What can I do? Yeah. Go ahead. I, I love that question. Just this morning, I was talking to 17 year olds about what they could do because people somehow think it's the government or it's the big business or whatever. I believe the fact that you've chosen to live where you're living I hope that you're taking public transit, or even better yet, you're walking as much as you can. I'm on the, I have to declare my conflict of interest, I'm on the board of TransLink as well. <laughs> but I hope you're taking transit. Um, but I also hope that you're reaching out and being a part of the social infrastructure of your particular neighborhood. The ultimate, in my opinion, the ultimate unit of our resilience and success is gonna be our neighborhoods. And so they are physical places, and we're trying to make those better, but they're mostly social places. And where Anne and I found the leadership in our city to invent the future was in all the organizations within the neighborhood context. So I think if you did nothing else but spent one half hour a day put in over the week somewhere, you could change the world by yourself. And if every one of us did it, we would all change the world. We uh, Ann and I, am, uh, I know Ann does, I do too, we, we have certain volunteer things that we just do because that's a part of making a community. And honestly, there's no policy that can do that. There's no plan that can do that. There's no money that can do that. It's just you. Let me give you an example of how you can help. When we were out doing neighborhood plans, community got involved. They realized there was only limited money they had to decide which services they wanted to improve, the libraries, the community center. And what was very interesting was that after the neighborhood sort of put some priorities, citizens, people who've been part of the discussion, got together and said, well, clearly our planting on the streets isn't the highest priority, but it's important to us. So they got out and started doing it. And I think over about three years, we had over 70 committees in neighborhoods kind of create themselves to go out and do things, whether it was a pajama patrol to watch what happened at night where people were leaving um, 
condoms and uh, needles around parks, getting them picked up before the children came to school, all sorts of different things which together built two things. One, a better community, but also a shared sense of responsibility. So if indeed the day comes when we have a major catastrophe, maybe an earthquake, what I saw in those neighborhoods was people knowing that's Mrs. Brown. Better check she's okay, not it's somebody. And I think that's what people can do. You can start being part of doing something which improves your neighborhood and builds that community and resiliency for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, are there ways uh, Vancouver can incorporate a social housing model of Vienna, Austria, whereby the government is more active, uh, more active in building housing? The more common solution we have heard over the years is uh, based on the market uh, solution. And uh, what happened with the market solution is uh, the developers spend a lot of resource building high-end expensive housing, and most of the middle class is being pushed out in New York and Paris all over the world. So I'm just wondering your thought yeah. on that. Well, this Thank is you. all my fault. You see, I was the first housing planner in the early 1970s that the city hired, and obviously I didn't do my job. But let me tell you what has worked, and this gets us back to Vienna. During the 70s and 80s, the federal government was putting a lot more resources into nonprofit and co-op housing. Just the city itself was working with nonprofit groups to produce a thousand units a year of rent geared to income housing. But over the years, senior governments have downloaded more and more onto c responsibilities onto cities while taking away resources from the cities. And so this upcoming city plan, I think one of the hopes is that there'll be some answers around affordable housing. I would be very surprised if there are. There's a lot of policies now in the city, but what we don't have are those extra resources that are often needed to take a home and make it affordable, or an apartment and make it affordable. So I think one thing I was working on before I left it retired was working with other governments across Canada to come up with a new deal for cities where we could look at the taxes that we all pay together and put them on the table and say what do cities need they've done more of that in places like Vienna but there aren't the resources we've got very limited money available for the city so with all the best will in the world trying to make new housing affordable isn't within the city's budget. And that's but, the challenge. But it, is, but it is true that we're beginning, thankfully, to see some action on this that I haven't seen in years. I was just the other day sitting with BC Housing, and they have a new program, 55,000 units for middle-income people, which has finally been funded, which they're finally put, I was helping them to negotiate some particular deals to put that in locations. So we do have that starting to happen and that will be for middle-income people as compared to low-income people. But what you're talking about, in my opinion, is where we have to go. Where we have to go is a secure sector of housing not just housing that might come in for the first few years and be affordable and then you sell it, but housing that will always be affordable. The thing about that Viennese housing, and it's an extraordinary model, it came out of the war because of what happened in the war, is that almost all the housing is of a secure, different levels of income security, and it makes it easier. Rotterdam has the very same thing. One of the things that we're starting to see, and this is very, very optimistic to see, is we're starting to see here nonprofit development companies. These are nonprofit organizations who are doing developments specifically for modest and middle-income people. Catalyst Development is, is one of those, and there's two or three of them, 
that is how in, Rot in Rotterdam that they were able to secure housing. That's how the Viennese housing was done. And what they're doing is they're, go they're finding property that is underutilized but is in, say, a church's hands or a community organization's hands, and they're helping them to develop that, and that includes housing. It's usually rental housing. Sometimes it's nonprofit home ownership and or co-ops. We just have to get back into the practice that Anne referenced. You know, back in the 50s, 60s, and, so, and even into the 70s, in this country, we had a rich, rich set of tools to help people find a place to live. And there was no homelessness back then to speak of after the Great Depression. We just stopped all that. And we have to get back into it. And so there's an election coming up federally. You must ask all of the political parties to, to tell you what their housing strategy is for this country. Because it's no longer here. I tried to speak to a, a, a budding prime minister a while back about you know uh, the situation of Vancouver. And he said, oh yeah, that's the problem in Vancouver, but not in the rest of the country. No, no interest. Well, Toronto, Halifax, every city in the country has this problem now. So. I think we could get a national housing policy, a much stronger one than we have. We could get a lot more resources. But you know, we all have to exercise our right as citizens and just insist. Yep. But there is lots of housing policy. It's just that there's not the resources, the product available. Yeah. We have time for about uh, two more questions, possibly three. Three, if, if you're short, or, or, or opinions or comments. I just want to say I'm a fourth generation Vancouverite, and I want to say thank you. We're obviously very fortunate to have had the two of you people working for our city all these years. And just as a, an accolade and a thank you again, the decision on the Arbutus Greenway was the best, one of the best things the city has ever done. <laughs> and I go, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you see. Boy, did we look as if we were going whistling in the wind when we took that all the way to the Supreme Court. Oh, it's just Got awesome. It. And you see in these neighborhoods, yep. people who were all, you had to get by on car all the time. You see people are out there biking and walking with their babies and cycling and skateboarding and everything. It's just absolutely the best. I enjoy it every day. So, but my question was, with the affordable housing and all this foreign ownership tax on the houses in Vancouver and the empty home tax, all that jazz, um, where is that money being earmarked for and is it actually being earmarked for our community? Yeah. I'm not sure we're the people to ask because we're not collecting the money at the moment. <laughs> I'm, I'm told. Yeah, I'm, I'm told. Yeah. I'm told that that money is being channeled to help support some of these new initiatives for that 55,000 units that that I was just telling you about that is being handled through BC Housing. Yeah. But I want to speak yeah. a little bit more broadly about this, and I'm now reaching way beyond uh, the previous commentary. Uh, you know, I think you can start with a few defensive taxes. But that's never going to solve the problem. I don't think those defensive taxes are going to build any kind of housing. What has to happen is that we have to decide as a society that we're going to build housing for everyone. You know, we've built 600 homeless units. We must build 1,200 more. We know it. If we don't build it, they will be on the streets. That's just a simple thing. It doesn't take theory. It doesn't take policy. It doesn't take anything. It just takes a motivation bias to do it. We've got to say now that the, our city is a world city. It's no longer that backwater that we talked about that no one cared about. It is a world city. We are going to have people coming here. So we have to secure housing for our people. We have to make sure that that's top priority. We haven't had a policy framework to do that. And that's what I say in my book. It's no longer a case where we can just let the market do its thing. By the same token, we must let the wor market do its thing. That's the other side of the equation. When we stop everything, we will also stop jobs. We will stop people wanting to come here. You know, it's a balancing act. But the balancing act has to have a first principle. And the first principle is we house our people. Full stop, yep. in my opinion. Yep. And at the same time, realizing that there's issues around resilience and sustainability, climate change, 
we also I have to start thinking of climate migration. There's going to be places in the world which are already experiencing this. I was and, and Trump migration. Yeah, and Trump <laughs> migration. <laughs> and uh, you see some of the areas. I was in the Sahara not too long ago. Uh, that's what an urban planner does, goes to a, a, a Sahara. But you see people who are being forced out of their homes. And we're going to see this on a much larger scale and continuing issue. So this isn't a one thing. This is another one of those big issues that's hitting us. Yeah. My name is Wendy, and I've been admiring you from afar for a long time. <laughs> And I'm going to speak on behalf of this audience and say that we're blessed to have you. That really what we're looking at here is a miracle of teamwork. You're a couple of tough cookies, <laughs> together and individually. And I can't believe what you are able to accomplish. So my question's about teamwork. Could you honestly tell us how you did it without killing each other? <laughs> Well, my, an <laughs> my answer was it was very easy because we both had a passion for the city but a real interest and expertise in different parts of that passion. So we weren't competing with each other. We were both moving in the same direction. And Larry will tell his story about us being married. <laughs> 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 what he always says is that over the time that we were co-directors, it was even worse than being in a marriage because you couldn't under any circumstances be debating in public, going in different directions in public. We had to work out the issues and that wasn't coming to the lowest common denominator, that was building on better ideas and better ideas. So thank you for your comment. <laughs> I, I will say um, there was something we discovered, which uh, I commend to other cities, and that was having two co-directors meant that we literally could be in two places at one time, talking from a position of authority of the service and trying to deliver better service. But the second thing is we're both of a temperament that we just enjoy working together, and we do have different things that we like to do. That whole thing about, uh, it was like a marriage. We couldn't, but we could never disagree in public. We had a principle, never, ever, even once, not even according to whether she liked my tie or I liked her shirt, could we disagree in public. But the way we did it, and, and I just think it was wonderful, I, I, I can't, I miss it a lot, to be honest, was that we had a small circle of very wise people that we worked with, and we debated and we worked it together and we kept working, we kept working and we didn't ever settle until we were both happy, until our interests were really balanced and it was tremendous. That's called making magic and I think it's a good place to pause now and to stop and to thank our presenters for a really invigorating uh, event today. And thank you for your question. <laughs> we have a couple of very small but very delicious local gifts for you. <laughs> this is your food. This is your food. It's uh, Vancouver honey from Hives for Humanity. Uh, and the honey is harvested here and, uh, uh, and brought to you. I hope Thank it's from you the, so much. I hope it's, I hope from, it's from, from the bees up on the uh, convention center, center roof. It's, uh, it's from the bees around Vancouver okay. in different neighborhoods all over Vancouver. Thank you, great. And thank thank you all. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you. I'm going to be signing books in the back if anyone wants them. They're back there. Yeah. No, no, no.